Okay, so happy semester is beginning to people on YouTube. I'm going to respond here to a video that was posted by Ego Storms, and this is called Mediums, Clones, and Inflated YouTube Currency. I really enjoyed that video. I thought uh, Jared did a really good job of talking about some of the concerns that have been raised by both Nicholas Carr, and, and, you know, certainly his piece called Is Google Making Us Stupid is a great piece in the Atlantic for people to check out. And uh, I'm not familiar with the book that uh, that Ego Storms was referencing there, so I appreciate some of that uh, overview. I would also say um, the book by Marianne Wolf called Proust and the Squid, uh, very relevant on this, on the way that neurophysiology is in fact dependent upon various communication media and how literacy as it's atrophying is affecting uh, the way our brains are structured and organized and what that will mean. I do think that this has an, an ancient legacy. I mean, I think that what you said was right. I mean, clearly, the concerns go at least back to Plato. Uh, they go back, you know, before that even to, you know, ancient Judaic texts against admonishments of making graven images. I mean, there was concerns over the impact that communication technologies would have on people's psychology uh, that go back, you know, again, very, very into ancient times. I think in the modern world, the ways to come at some of this, you know, are are through McLuhan. You know, I think you're... you're reference to McLuhan at several points were very good and I was glad to see that you had McLuhan in the light referenced there in your span of books you know some of the books were very interesting there go to Lesherbach again a, a great book but what um, what McLuhan says in understanding media uh, he says Johnny can't read not because Johnny can't read but because Johnny can't imagine long-term goals See, it's this ability to imagine long-term goals that is perhaps being eroded or gutted out by these new instantaneous, you're always already connected media. And I think one way to talk about this, and this is, <clears throat> as much as I really agree with what you're, you're saying, and I, I do believe, and I would advocate uh, the same position you're giving, maybe for just YouTube and for argument's sake and for, you know, for fun of, of conversation, we could offer up maybe some concerns that would be counter to that and to see if we can do that as an imagination pump. I think one of the concerns that I've been uh, maybe sympathetic to uh, of those who are critical of Carr or are those who want to challenge Carr, and it comes from this sort of Deleuzean orientation, if people are familiar with uh, Deleuze, and it's the distinction between the arborescent and the rhizomatic. Right? The arborescent is the telos. It's the way that the oak grows out of the acorn, and it has this long-term trajectory towards its, its end. That's very different than the structure of crabgrass, which sort of moves laterally, and it crops up, and then it continues to have almost a, a short but wide-moving uh, orientation again it doesn't it doesn't progress to the end of the line but sort of pancake like flatly uh, spreads across and I think if we do think of the internet as a kind of rhizomatic structure then it seems like maybe it's not as good for individuals so I think you know ego storms with the, the points that you're making Jared there I think that, that they're very right that we would end up saying yeah I mean for individuals their long-term goals are going to be um, shortened, lessened, diminished, you know, I, I think that's part of it. But it's maybe more happily, it's a rise in the collective knowledge base that becomes just plain old common sense. Now, there's more distortion, there's more misinformation, but there's also greater access to good information. I mean, the problem is how do you recognize, quotes, the good sources from the bad sources, you know, legitimate um, sources from those that have been propped up by, as you suggest, basically clones. And I think that's part of the concern. You know, if you go look at someone like Ben Bagdikian and his media monopoly, I think most of us are just absolutely scandalized when we discover that it's about, you know, five to ten people who regulate around 80 to 90 percent of what you see on the major network television programs. And so we don't realize that 
all of these shows are subsidiaries of a larger, you know, division, which is a division, which is a division of, and then we find, you know, as Rupert Murdoch is at the top of it, right? I think in the same way that this sort of phenomena is ha happening on YouTube and these cropping up of, you know, little swarms of people who look like they're supporting someone, but they're actually that same person. I think the questions I would ask there are, Two, you know, w one is what is the role of anonymity in free speech? I don't think that you can have genuine free speech, and by that I mean the kind of conditions of ongoing free speech that we want, if you need anonymity in order to have it. See, now, anonymity is sometimes a good thing, and we could give an example of, like, anonymous review in a scholarly journal. Okay, now that happens, and there is, in fact, anonymous review, but those people are generally listed on the editorial board as potential reviewers. So they're actually public figures who the people know they potentially could be sent to review. Sh sheer, unknown anonymity seems very different. It seems like the recourse to the powerless and to basically the person who almost needs to take terrorist kind of strategies because if they do get found out, they, f they, they fear that their, their ideas won't be accepted. Well, at that point, we're really not talking about free speech. We're talking about ways of circumventing power through anonymity. Okay, so I mean, that, I think that's the thing. The other thing is, and this would be more a fun thing that you know, we can laugh at and hopefully maybe other people can think about is, to those poor people who have multiple channels and you're running around and you're, if you're commenting on your own channel or you're playing games with other people with all that, you're probably doing weird, weird things to your brain, to your sense of interactions with others, to the sensibilities of your own right for self-esteem and self-worth. Uh, my guess is that People who do a lot of that kind of stuff become mangled in social interaction. And I don't mean like in a causal way, like, oh, there is some causal relation between using computers in certain ways and your psychological sort of profile and interaction competencies are affected. I mean it more metaphorically. I mean that I think people who do spend lots of time pointing and clicking and deleting it has a metaphorical carryover. We end up starting to think of others as if they're just machines that we can access information from and get information. And then we don't really deal with all of those you know, sort of dynamic issues. You know, I remember when I was a little kid, we used to watch Schoolhouse Rock. I don't know if people remember this, but Schoolhouse Rock had this catchy little song. It was almost like an a, a earworm where it would go, I'm a machine, you're a machine. Everyone you know, they're a machine. You're a revved up high power body machine. That's what they would say. And I think that's gotten into people's heads. People somehow think that they're machines, and they're not. A human being, a body, is not a machine. A machine is a thing in space and time. Bodies are the way the world worlds itself. The world can't even be the world without bodies to give it the particular space, time, depths, and perspectives and orientations that it has from a body. Bodies have you know respiration and metabolism and they grow and age and have an ontogenesis and they're subject to allergies and to epigenetic interactions due to dietary practices putting fuel in a car and having something come out the exhaust is not in any way other than very metaphorically similar to our bodies um, but I think the more that people interact with machines and the more that they spend time uh, dinking around with computers, especially ones that simulate lifetime interaction. See, a book is a kind of technology, but it never simulates lifetime interaction the way this is. I mean, this right here, it almost feels like I'm talking to you, but I'm not talking to you. You're listening to a tape of a me who's already left the, the room. Okay, at any rate, I really enjoyed your video. Thanks.